Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started. I think we're starting to see a critical mass join. Um, welcome to our Climate Week event. We're really excited everyone was able to join us today. We um, are also just really happy to have this conversation about carbon removal amidst all of the other very important climate topics during Climate Week. So that is very exciting for all of us who are working on that topic on a day to day basis. We are just going to have a conversation today with all of these folks who are really dedicated to working on scaling carbon removal innovation. We're going to talk a little bit about what we are all seeing in the space as different organizations working on that from slightly different angles. I think we have a shared mission here, but our organizations all do offer something slightly different, but we all share the hope and vision that we can really bring new carbon removal solutions um, into the world and scale them up as quickly as we possibly can. We're going to go ahead and just introduce everyone quickly and then get into some of the big topics that we hear around carbon removal. Why does this matter? Why is it important within the broader climate conversation? What are we seeing the biggest challenges to be in this space? We're going to do a nice Q&A session at the end, so please use the Q&A feature on the webinar. Um, as you uh, think of a question, pop it in there. We'll go through them all at the end. And you know, if it's for someone specific, just mention that and we can make sure it gets assigned to the right person. Um, some of them I'm sure will be things that many people have comments about, but we will tackle those as they come in. But yeah, let's just kick things off quickly with some introductions. So my name is Nikki Batchelor. I am the director for the XPRIZE Carbon Removal. Um, I've been with XPRIZE for about six years, working on the last Energy Cosia Carbon XPRIZE. So I've seen the space of carbon tech grow, and now we're really excited to be working more directly on carbon removal at XPRIZE. We have this giant competition running right now, sponsored by the Musk Foundation. We are seeing a ton of new innovation come online and into the space for consideration for that prize. So that's great to see. We are almost at 500 registered teams in the competition, and that is, you know, really great to see how much activity is going on in the space. And, you know, we can't do it alone. Those innovators can't do it alone. So we're grateful to all of these other folks on the call today who are really part of this growing ecosystem that is dedicated to accelerating all of the new technology that's coming online and you know, everything from fundraising support to mentorship and industry partnerships are really key to seeing this move on. So we are really happy to be collaborating on that um, with everyone. So with that, I'll hand it over to Tito. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and Airminers? Hey, everybody. Uh, let's see. So Airminers Launchpad is a six-week program uh, focused on early stage uh, startup founders working on program removal. Um, I actually just hopped out of a, a session that we're doing, we just started batch two, and everybody's back there interviewing with uh, with Rob Niven, the CEO of Carbon Cure. So getting uh, tips from somebody who has successfully navigated the, the carbon world. Um, but yeah, it runs every six weeks. Uh, it runs for six weeks. We do it quarterly, uh, and we're focused on how do we get to a thousand shots on goal. So working on very early stage companies, you've got a technology, but maybe you haven't started building on a business model or uh, or started talking to customers. That's going to be the, the perfect fit for uh, for Launchpad. So it's it's definitely at the, the earliest stage of um, uh, of the of the kind of accelerator pipeline. Uh, and I'll hand it off to whoever's next. You can all call on your next guest. So I'll just pass this one to Frederic, but you can call on whoever you want to go after you. Hey everyone, uh, nice to be with you. Uh, thanks, Nikki and the team at XPRIZE for the opportunity. Uh, the Carbon to Bio initiative, uh, it's a multi-year, multi-stakeholder uh, initiative launched in 2020 uh, by three organizations, the Urban Future Lab, which is New York's uh, longest running climate tech incubator, uh, Green Town Labs, uh, North America's largest climate tech incubator with offices in Boston and Houston, and Fraunhofer USA, which is a leading applied R&D organization with a global footprint. And we were supported by NYSERDA, uh, the New York State Energy Research and Development Agency. Uh, the goal of CLUV is really to accelerate the commercialization of carbon tech. Uh, so we define carbon tech by with technologies and business models uh, that capture, use, or sequester carbon. So in that way, we are a little bit different. We definitely include carbon removal as a carbon tech uh, technology, but we don't uh, necessarily limit ourselves to carbon removal. 
Um, and we want to focus on helping grow the carbon tech ecosystem. So the way we do it is that every year we select a handful of startups. Uh, typically this year we had 10, 10 cohort members out of 130 applicants. And uh, we focus on industry partnerships. Uh, so we don't take equity, we don't provide funding, but we, we're going to connect you uh, with leader in the carbon tech space. Uh, currently we have 12 corporates representing different industry verticals. And so the value for your company is really to explore uh, the value proposition of your technology in different industry verticals. Uh, we also have uh, two government representatives, Canada and the New York state and five carbon tech experts of which XPRIZE, but also uh, Carbon Plan, Carbon 180, Carbon Direct, uh, and Circular Carbon Network, part of this Carbon Tech Leadership Council. And so really the, the privilege there is to access these resources uh, and to focus on industry partnerships. And you should be at least TRL4 to consider applying. Of course, it's always a bit of a gray line, uh, but it's definitely on the later stage uh, side, I, I would say, compared to other programs here. And next I would call uh, Marianne. Thanks, Fred. Uh, and also thanks, Nikki, for setting this up. Uh, very happy to be here. Uh, so I call it the uh, Carbon Removal Climate Accelerator. We are a program dedicated to European uh, CDR startups uh, from ranging from uh, everything pre-seed TRL2, so very early up to teams that uh, have already have customers and potentially are raising you know, the second bigger round, Series A right now. We support these teams with non-dilutive grants, with coaching, mentoring, technology, and impact validation, and also stakeholder engagement uh, over the course of one year. Uh, we will be running this twice a year, so two intakes a year. The program is run by us. Uh, we are the Sustainability and Business Lab at ETH Zurich. Uh, ETH Zurich is one of the leading research universities in Europe, and we are sort of think and do tank that does mostly industry projects, mostly in hard to decarbonize sectors like waste energy, cement, maritime shipping, aviation. And we co-lead the program together with the TU Delft, another university uh, from the Netherlands. And the program is co-funded by Climate Kick, which is the EU's innovation, climate innovation program. And we also have a couple of other uh, partners on board. We just closed our first round of applications. We received around 100 from all over Europe and are now excited to start with the first 26 teams this week, actually. Brett, handing over to you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Brad Ack, the Executive Director of Ocean Visions. Ocean Visions is not a traditional accelerator. We're really even an accelerator at all. We are a network of uh, academic and research institutions in the ocean space. Uh, big names like Stanford and Scripps and MIT and Woods Hole partnered with a number of accelerators such as Ocean Exchange and Sustainable Ocean Alliance LARTA Associates and Creative Destruction Labs, um, as well as others to bring uh, solutions to critical problems facing the oceans. And too much, seed, too much carbon in the atmosphere and in the water is the most critical problem facing the oceans. And so for that reason, we have decided to put our weight behind ocean-based competitors to uh, the XPRIZE carbon removal. The ocean pathways for carbon removal are, are really not as developed, uh, relatively speaking, as many of the terrestrial options. And so our contribution in this space will be for a select group of competitive teams um, that will go through the application process to Ocean Visions. We will put together custom teams of people with the disciplines uh, from the academic and research institutions the disciplines that your team might need to really prove out the technology and be able to meet the critical milestones in the XPRIZE competition. Uh, and so these teams will actually work with you at no cost. Uh, we're talking about top talent um, for somewhere between a year to two years as you go through the process of the XPRIZE competition. Again, it's only for competitors with an ocean-based approach, open to anyone anywhere in the world, uh, no IP uh, uh, ownership, anything like that on our side, no, no, um, you know, uh, uh, no share or stake in the company. This is purely done as a way to raise the field overall. And I'm happy to talk to any people who are interested uh, as time goes on. Thank you. Oh, and next I will go to Kevin. 
Thanks, uh, Brad, and uh, thanks for the invitation and uh, joining us today. I'm uh, Kevin Krauser, CEO and co-founder of Avatar Innovations. Um, we're a groundbreaking energy transition and carbon technology innovation uh, and investment firm that works inside heavy industry for decarbonization. Um, we were pleased recently to uh, launch a partnership uh, with XPRIZE surrounding um, bringing um, heavy industrial players uh, to the table uh, with emerging carbon removal technologies uh, for, partner for partnership and scale. Um, a lot of the emerging carbon dioxide removal technologies to win this XPRIZE, you're going to need uh, industrial scale uh, to hit, uh, hit the gigaton and uh, we're pretty pleased. Um, we just closed um, registrations last week and admitted uh, 10 parties from four different continents uh, into this process and we're kicking off on October 1st. Uh, and that will be really a co-development process. We're calling it an accelerator for, for terms, but it's really an industrial co-development process uh, with some major carbon technology international players. Um, and they'll be ready for their early bird submissions um, by February 1st. Um, and we're evaluating our, our next intake because uh, we were a little overwhelmed with the, uh, the amount of, of, of amazing opportunities that came our way. So thanks for the invitation and I look forward to working with, with this group and advancing the cause of carbon removal. And off to you, Omid. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Omid Tube, and I'm representing the Creative Destruction Lab. Um, creating, Creative Destruction Lab is a non-for-profit group um, that focuses on commercializing um, technology-based, scientific-driven um, innovations that has the capacity to change human life for the betterment of human life. We um, operate a, a mentorship program focused on helping um, technology-driven ventures that are at the TRL of four to seven um, and generally, we aim to provide a sustain, um, access to sustained judgment. And what I mean by this is that we pair ventures with uh, both commercial and technical mentors that um, have expertise in various technology areas. Two years ago, we started our um, climate stream that, that operates out of Vancouver, um, uh, Oxford at London, and Paris. Um, and we generally focus on a number of uh, carbon removal, carbon sequestration, and resource preservation areas. Um, I'm happy, very happy to be here and happy to connect with anyone who has interest in our program and uh, or collaborating with us to, to participate as, as part of Express. And I think I was the last person, maybe. Yeah, I think we made it through. All right, thanks everyone for the backgrounds. Um, that was just a little level setting. So we know who everyone is, what we're all working on. I think we'd like to dig into some interesting questions here and just you know discuss what's going on in the space. I think a lot of people come and approach all of us with various questions about what we're seeing, why does this matter, where are we going? So I think we just wanna take some time to, to have a group conversation about that and um, you know, also bring the audience in for some of that conversation in a bit. So to kick us off, Tito, question for you. Why don't you give us your spiel about why does carbon removal matter? And then how does that play into how you think about running air miners, the vision for that organization, which has really, you know, grown amazingly over the last year or two, and we're seeing so much activity in that space. And I know you have a very clear kind of vision for how you articulate it. So I think that'd be a good place to start. Yeah, great. Um, let's see. So, so first off, from a from a high level, it's it's climate week, uh, and it's it's worth acknowledging that there is just so much going on besides the climate. Most of us are calling in from. From our bedrooms, from our homes, rather than offices or labs, uh, because of the spread of, of COVID. Um, even just in the context of the climate world, there's uh, there's so many solutions working on uh, getting carbon neutral, so reducing emissions. Um, what uh, what the reason carbon carbon removal is needed because there's uh, there's still too much carbon dioxide already in the atmosphere, um, and there are incredible people working on solutions. Uh, to, to pull carbon from the air. Uh, the way that we think about it at Air Myers is it, we're just so early in this, in this industry. Uh, and so our focus has been on inspiring, 
educating and accelerating solutions to carbon removal. We think of it like we need a thousand shots on goal. So we need more people uh, making a go at a solution for carbon removal. It's, it's not just a matter of taking something that's out there already and, and scaling it up. That, that actually won't work. Um, so we need new ideas, new concepts, new people working on solutions. So uh, inspiring, uh, getting out there. We have an event series that we host uh, with, with luminaries in the field, with people who are up and coming in the field. Uh, educate, we have an airliners boot up, which is a, um, a five week uh, kind of online book club course that you can go through with other people to learn about carbon removal. Uh, and then our uh, airliners launch pad, where we're helping uh, early stage startup companies get formed, get connected to customers. Um, but really thinking about because we're at the, uh, the, the creation of this industry, how do we get the right people? How do we get the right thinking? How do we get the right culture uh, to get to gigaton scale carbon removal uh, and to get to a thousand shots on a uh, thousand shots on goal from, uh, from a diversity of, of, of backgrounds of, of different founders? Yeah, so let's just build on that as a foundation. I have some questions for each of you, but I think you're all welcome to speak to that first prompt, which is, you know, really why does carbon removal matter? Because I think that's a question that we all care about and might have different answers to. So to add on, Brad, from your perspective, where do we stand in the space of carbon removal versus where we need to go? And how do you think about it from the ocean perspective specifically with all the work that you're doing at Ocean Visions? Thank you for that. Um, first, just to build on, on the question of why it matters, you know, we're already past the point of danger for the biosphere, right? We all know this. I mean, we're, we're experiencing an ever shifting baseline of what we consider to be acceptable damage to people and to nature. And now we're at, uh, in the throes of a, an extinction crisis that's caused by in large part, not entirely, but in very large part by a changing climate. We have enormous impacts to the oceans, which we like to say have shielded us from the worst effects of carbon, but it's like your friend taking a hit for you. It's not that they're uh, all right. The ocean is in grave, uh, you know, in grave danger as a result of too much heat being trapped in the atmosphere, most of which is going into the ocean and too much carbon going directly into the ocean. So we're already past the danger zone and in fact, uh, I saw a story the other day that we may be exceeding about four of the critical planetary boundaries already. The only way back from that, the only way back from that is getting atmospheric and oceanic CO2 levels down. And there's only two ways to do that. Turning off the tap, which is what 97% of the world is focused on, and cleaning up the mess, which is the rest of the 3% of us. And you know, those numbers are illustrative. I have no idea what the actual relative investment is, but I, I'm positive it's at least nine to one um, in terms of trying to stop the pollution versus cleaning up the pollution. So where are we? We're very nascent in this journey, right? There was a big story a couple of weeks ago about Climeworks new plant in Iceland. Exciting, 4,000 tons a year of CO2, okay? Add a zero, and then another zero, and then another zero, and then three more, and that's where we need to be this year at four billion tons, okay? So we're talking six orders of magnitude away from where we need to be. And that's at the low end of the estimates. We're probably gonna need to be at around 10 billion tons a year very soon in order to really make a dent to this crisis. So. We have a massive job to do. We are really excited that Elon Musk and the foundation have shown a spotlight in this area with this money. Money talks, it's important, gets people going. We need, as, as Tito says, I couldn't agree more, a thousand or maybe a million shots on goal to win this fight. Thanks, Brad. Um, building on that a little bit more, Fred, I'm curious from your perspective, you know, running the C2B initiative and that community, it bridges a little bit broader than just carbon removal. Um, how do you see that conversation playing out from your perspective of all of the different startups that have been coming in that you've been working with? Um, where are people seeing the carbon removal space go and evolve over the last year? Yeah, no, it's super interesting. Uh, so you mentioned, you know, we are not specifically focused on carbon removal, but carbon removal is part 
of carbon tech, of the scope we consider being carbon tech. And you know, traditionally carbon tech uh, is better understood as like making useful products like fuels and chemicals and materials from CO2. But we see an, a fourth class of product really emerging, which is carbon removal as a product or as a service. Um, and you know, as a market, I think we'll talk a little bit about market later. Um, and so we, we have at least three companies in our cohort that are really uh, focusing on carbon removal. Uh, just to give you three examples, the first one is Patch. So Patch is like a software marketplace and where they're going to be helpful is to scale the demand, uh, the market demand for carbon removal. So people who want to buy carbon removal as a service or as a product and uh, scale and connect that demand with the supply. So being kind of an intermediary between the two. Uh, another example um, of an engineering an engineered solution, not, not a software solution, uh, CarbFix out of Iceland. So they're really looking at low cost sequestration, uh, mineralizing the CO2 into basalt. And they're all about carbon removal, all about sequest safe, you know, low cost, reliable, measurable, um, way to, uh, to, to capture the CO2 and then to, to get it into the ground. And then the last one that is, has a heavy carbon removal place, planetary hydrogen, which is actually an ocean play, uh, place. So they, they kind of leverage the ocean chemistry to use the ocean as a massive direct air capture device, if you will. And that's an interesting uh, longer term, but potentially very promising uh, and scalable uh, carbon removal solution. Um, so that's what we see. Uh, I would say there is another trend that we see that everyone wants to be carbon negative and be carbon removal classified. I would, I would say be very careful with how we use the terminology. We can only use carbon removal, uh, you know, if you're sourcing CO2 from the atmosphere. And then if you're storing it for 100 or ideally thousands of year, reliably, safely, and measurably. Um, and then add, the other condition is that the energy and the material that you're using to do so should not be bigger than the CO2 you're taking uh, out of the atmosphere. Uh, otherwise, you're not net negative. And so that's gonna, not going to be really uh, useful. And so always be critical about when you hear about carbon removal solution, you know, where do they sort of, where do they sort of CO2? What is the permanency of the CO2? Uh, and how much kind of energy and inputs, the carbon intensity of these inputs uh, uh, might be. Um, the, so that's kind of what we see. So, you know, carbon removal for us is a gold standard. It's like the best we can do, but there are other approaches in carbon tech where it can, that can help to reduce emissions uh, in, the, in the shorter term and maybe more, more, more economically in the short term. I want to jump back in here. Brad, I want to ask a follow-up question that I saw in the chat here, which I feel like might just be a good ground setting for folks. So someone is asking, what are the merits of ocean removal versus atmospheric CO2 removal? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so first of all, the, the, there are a number of dimensions to that. One is the sheer size of the ocean in that 70% of the planet, we are going to have to employ that space in this race for uh, massive carbon removal. Um, so no matter what technique we use, we, we have to think about how the oceans come into play. Um, the oceans and the atmosphere are sort of in a dynamic equilibrium of carbon concentration. And so as you pull carbon out of the atmosphere, the ocean, which has absorbed this excess anthropogenic carbon is going to respire it back into the atmosphere. So there really isn't a comprehensive carbon removal solution that isn't gonna also involve the oceans. Secondly, the concentration of CO2 in seawater is significantly higher than it is in air. So things like direct air capture applied to the ocean may have a much higher probability of efficiency uh, than what we see on land simply because of the volume of CO2 in the water. Third, the oceans um, already are the major uh, system on the planet that cycle carbon. There's about 50 times more carbon in the deep ocean um, than in the atmosphere. Uh, and so you can see how just simple, uh, excuse me, just slight changes to overall oceanic carbon, not dissolved uh, uh, carbon, um, 
not dissolved CO2, but, but oceanic carbon in the deep sea could make a, a very big difference. But we need both. We are not trying to hold out that oceans are better than the atmosphere as, as approaches. As Again, back to the thousand shots on goal. We need everything we can get that works, that has a strong uh, positive life cycle analysis to it. Thanks for that. One thing that's exciting, I think, about this group of folks that is assembled here is that we have a range of perspectives, some people working on more specific areas like ocean versus atmospheric or carbon tech, you know, we have, we have those kinds of thematic areas. We also have different geographic focuses in some cases. So I want to shift for a minute and kind of talk about maybe some of the comparisons between the conversation that we're seeing here in the US versus Canada and Europe. So Marianne, over to you. How are you seeing the carbon removal landscape right now in Europe? And I know you guys also just closed your submission. Are there any interesting takeaways from this kind of first group of cohort that you're starting to see emerge? Yeah, sure. So um, to the first question, I think Brad talked about nascency. I mean, if, if this complete space is nascent, then unfortunately, I think we in Europe are, are a bit lagging behind and a bit more nascent. Um, I think it's also evident in the panel here. I mean, I'm I'm the only one, the rest of you is all, all, all are located uh, in the US or in Canada. Um, and I think we see that especially in the number of um, deployment and innovation um, on the ground uh, in Europe. I mean, besides Climeworks and CARB6, which interestingly, both of you, uh, uh, Brad and, uh, and Fred, you have mentioned, uh, there really are not a whole lot of established CDR players in Europe yet. Uh, and you know, that's surprising given that, I mean, we have great research universities we have great impact on the uh, ecosystems right but but i think there's there's two reasons why why that hasn't happened yet one is i think we lack the um the clarity and certainty around policy that you guys in the us have already established i think lcsf and 45q have been you know really great catalysts for for cdr in the us and we certainly do not have that and i'd wish for for this importance of CDR, both in policy and in general, to be recognized more on an EU level, but also on, on the national level. And uh, you know, organizations like Carbon 180 are doing a great, or have been doing a great job in the US. And I'm, I'm very glad that you know we're slowly starting to see similar organizations pop up in, in Europe to work on that. Carbon Removal Advocacy Europe is one of them. Ex very excited to, to see the work that, that they'll be doing. And I think the second reason why we're, we're lagging a bit behind is procurement. I think from the the big procurers that are out there that have, you know, shown that they are willing to buy early to buy at, at a premium price, um, except for Swiss Re, none of them have come out of Europe. And I think while you know Stripe, Microsoft, Shopify, all of them have been sourcing globally, it is you know a, a sign uh, also for local ecosystems if a local buyer, so European buyer, went ahead and, and was okay with paying those premiums and. You know, quite frankly, we have those corporates, and those corporates have aggressive targets. They just need to follow up on them, right? Um, and reg with regards to the submissions, actually, those are the points that, that were also addressed by the teams uh, when we asked them why they wanted to, uh, why they were applying, and what they would need help with. One was uh, unclarity around EU regulation uh, regarding verification, regarding methodologies, regarding incentivization. The second one was they would like to get a better understanding of how these procurers source, what are the requirements they would need to fulfill in order to become eligible for a Stripe, for a Klarna, for a Microsoft. And the third thing, which I haven't mentioned, is that things lots of funding, VC funding specifically. I think there's a just greater appetite for deep tech uh, in the VC ecosystem uh, in the US uh, or in North America in general uh, compared to Europe. I think that's changing and I'm excited about it. And we are also trying to change it. But, um, but but I think we still have, have a bit to go and to catch up with you guys. I just wanna pick up on two things that you mentioned in case folks in the audience don't know what 45Q or LCFS are. Open question to the group, who wants to explain those? <laughs> I, can, I can jump because it was going to be in a little bit of my kind of commentary. So 45Q is the U.S. Uh, government standards for sort of carbon removal offset protocol legislation. Um, it was an attempt to 
turn carbon offsets or carbon removal technologies um, into a fungible market. Um, there's a variety of jurisdictions around the world looking at our own. Canada's recently implemented something very similar. Um, and this, I think, speaks to you know, the emerging um, carbon protocol that needs to happen for this market to truly unlock itself. Um, that'd be an introductory policy question. Um, <laughs> I know enough to be dangerous on this and I know it's uh, an emerging issue. What I would say is I think one of the big hopes for COP26 um, is the ratification of Article 6. Article 6 is a provision in the Paris Convention that would allow an international tradable um, carbon offset market. Currently right now in Canada and I believe the US, you've got voluntary offsets and, and, and compliance offsets. They're not all created equal. Um, that's somewhere that needs to, to. We need to put a lot of effort uh, into as a as a planet. Well, you were next up on the question as well, so I'll just hand it over to you to speak for a minute about you know what are you seeing the landscape like in Canada? How are you seeing people talk about carbon removal? You know, especially in comparison to how folks have described it um, so far in in the U.S. and in Europe. Yeah, for sure. We well, gave me the hard question first, Nikki. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, first of all, uh, it's great to be included in this group. And, and, and I think building on, on Tito and Brad's kind of commentary is that net zero is not going to be enough. Um, we need to be thinking about what, what carbon negative solutions do look like. The way I think about this is, you know, if you've got a bathtub and you're filling it up with carbon dioxide and it's overflowing, the first thing you're going to do is shut the tap off. But the next thing you're going to do is open up the drain. And so how can we work on both of those solutions concurrently? Because right now we got, the, we got the tap closed or we got the tap on and the drain, drain closed. Um, and so this is, I think, a, a really valuable and important uh, area for us to work on. And, and I think it's really the Apollo project of our generation. Um, this is going to require an all hands on deck solution um, that we need every party at the table. Um, so I think this is such a fantastic initiative and we're, we're delighted to be lending our support. Uh, in terms of Canada and, and CDR, actually, we're um, one of the one of the birthplaces of, of, of carbon removal technologies. Uh, carbon Engineering, the largest uh, carbon removal uh, company in the world right now, was born right here in my hometown, Calgary. Much of the leadership team uh, is still here, and so there's a pretty awesome carbon technology ecosystem uh, in Calgary and, and Canada, kind of at, at abroad. We were happy to host uh, the COSIA X Prize, um, which led to the winner of Carbon Cure uh, and built the Alberta Carbon Conversion Technology Center, uh, one of the world's leading uh, carbon technology centers. So I think, you know, one of the, now that being said, despite Canada's, I think, early start on this race, it's still, uh, a, I'd still say we're in the, the first, first inning of it, but we're, we're proud of what we've um, accomplished uh, thus far. So, you know, I'd say broadly speaking, the unique aspect of how Canada is approaching this <clears throat> is, first of all, we've got a really blessed um, land or geographical position for a lot of these solutions, both the second largest landmass in the world, as well as the longest coastline in the world, uh, to be really looking at the type of industrial scale for, um, in, you know, in, for gigaton type removal. Um, you know, secondarily, I think we've got a, a fantastic sort of research hub uh, that's been driving a lot of these um, initiatives like carbon engineering um, and, and others. Um, and, you know, I'd say risk capital is starting to come to the table. And I'd say that's from the industrial parties. So, you know, as I mentioned in my <clears throat> opening <clears throat> remarks, we're proud to have partnered with um, five of the largest energy companies uh, in the world um, to be supporting these initiatives. And at you know, first glance, you'll say, well, they're part of the problem. Um, but the flip side of that coin is they're probably the most motivated investors and technology players on the planet to actually get these initiatives uh, off the ground. And seeing them come to the table uh, is that all hands on deck solution. Um, and, you know, we just, as I said, we went through a round table yesterday um, and uh, each of them put up their hands for, for two carbon removal technology companies. They wanna, they wanna build towards this, this X prize. So industry is coming to the table. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, we need a fungible carbon offset market to um, turn this into uh, a real opportunity. Um, and Canada looks forward to, to working with uh, the many other jurisdictions um, as we solve this global challenge. Thanks, Kevin. 
Um, Omid, over for you, I'm just thinking about CDL and your structure is a little bit different than some of the other uh, programs represented here in the sense that you are working across many different thematic areas and tracks. You also have a fairly global footprint. Um, can you speak a little bit about why CDL decided to start working on carbon removal as a specific kind of area of focus and how long that has been in your portfolio? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'm happy to go last because there are a lot of the points I, I would have made uh, as already been mentioned by um, Frederick and uh, Tito and, and Kevin. So I, hopefully I'll just build on that. <clears throat> Generally speaking, um, because CDL is a mentorship program, we look at our ecosystem to help us figure out what is the next area we need to focus on. We leverage what we have at each of our ecosystem um, and look at what where we feel the market is ready for innovations. We identified climate three years ago as an area that we would like to expand. And we looked at all of the sites at CDL and decided that there are three of these locations, Vancouver, Oxford, and Paris, that are really poised to take advantage of the expertise in our region. So we started focusing on climate and we had a very holistic view on, of what our climate stream is going to look like. Um, partly for, for what has already been mentioned. So we believe ocean is important and um, we believe water preservation, atmosphere, all of these have a role to play. And we wanted to expand our, um, our, our net as wide, or cast our net as wide as we could. We also started looking at what are the, some of the players in, in our ecosystem that would need to drive this change. And similar to what Kevin said, we believe industry has a very big role to play. Um, so we designed our theme originally to see what are the short-term and, and long-term gains that we could have in the market or long-term innovations we can drive in the market. Um, so we started our climate stream last year, and originally we didn't have carbon removal as part of our um, themes. Very quickly after we started, we realized that for us to make a big difference and a meaningful difference, carbon removal needs to be one of our themes. So we've added that. And the partnership with XPRIZE and um, Air Miners, as well as a relationship with um, Kevin's group at Avatar, has been really helpful in unearthing some of the promising ventures that we've, we've been looking for, but not as successful um, as recruiting in the past. So we just closed our application, our, our finalizing our cohort. We expect that this year, probably 20 to 25% of our um, ventures in climate, so about, about five out of the 20 are going to be focused in this area. And we expect that this is going to be expanding and partnerships such as these one, the one we have with Air Miners and XPRIZE for us is incredibly important in driving the space. Great, thank you. So I was gonna ask the group to speak about what you see the biggest challenges are currently that startups are facing and what kind of support they need, how you think about tackling that through your programming. I'm gonna add on a question that I see from the audience about what specific technical skills one should learn in order to build these kinds of solutions. I feel like that is probably also very integrated with what you might answer the first part. So that's an open question. Who wants to go first? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to just start and then people can build on, but I think the biggest challenge right now for carbon removal is really market development. Like who's gonna, what are you selling? What is your product? And who's gonna buy it? Uh, right now we have, you know, three main buyers like Microsoft, Stripe and Shopify, but that's very small. And the question is who's gonna, what's, who's the next wave of, of carbon re removal uh, pur purchasing? Um, is it going to be individual? High, maybe rich people basically have a Tesla Model S approach, develop a very high-end luxury product that people want to buy a premium. After all, we are able to sell watches you know, for $10,000. Why couldn't we sell carbon uh, for, for $1,000? So I think market development is really key. That's why at the C2B initiative, we're trying to to develop economic cases for CO2 because we believe it's going to accelerate scaling these technologies. These technologies are very early still and they're still very expensive because they are operated at small scale. So if they have a better economic case through utilization, 
uh, with carbon tech, then they're going to scale faster to go then towards more carbon removal solution. That's kind of our uh, approach. Just, just to build on that a little bit, I agree that a lack of a robust market is a critical obstacle, but there's obstacles before that. And some of those came up in the chat, which is the app, the ability to verify and uh, assure carbon storage permanently and safely, right? And that gets to the social and political license to operate question, which is probably, in my view, the biggest hindrance to this space or the biggest hurdle we have to overcome is that people don't yet have the information that they need to trust that these solutions aren't going to be worse than the illness and you know so many things we've done throughout modern technology technological history have been in the name of good and have led to tremendous uh, downsides so we have this we have this really big hurdle to overcome which is a, a serious deficit of information about the broad environmental effects of some of these approaches the permanence of the carbon and to bring the public and, and uh, the, the interested communities along with us so that we can have a market that will incentivize and continue to drive growth in the area. Yeah, adding to Brad, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, that's also that something that teams come with to our program is that they need support in validating their tech and validating their impact most importantly right because because after all you know a ton removed really needs to be a ton removed and that that is a question that they themselves sometimes lack the skills to be able to to determine right so you asked about what skills you know potential entrepreneurs in this space need besides you know a, a lot of the other entrepreneurial skills and certainly especially on the engineering side it couldn't help to you know have a process engineering or chemical engineering degree um, an understanding of energy balances and an understanding of how for instance an lca fundamentally works and and how you would approach that uh, certainly couldn't help especially if you're sort of looking towards um, starting to enter the market because that is what is required by those few uh few buyers that are out there already yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll build on that in, in, in the sense that I think that the technical evaluation is, is, is going to be a critical piece, but I brought in it also to consider full life cycle evaluation. And I think there's a, there's, there's a gap on that. If you, you factor in scope three emissions for a lot of these companies to actually prove that they're true kind of carbon negative solutions as opposed to just immediately carbon <laughs> negative, if, if you will. Um, the next piece I think that is, is going to be really important for a lot of these is actually customer access. In the sense that because you don't have a market right now, a lot of how, what is the path to market for um, a lot of these types of solutions? You've seen tremendous advancements that have come out from the RFPs from Microsoft and from Stripe around you know wildly inflated carbon markets. Um, Goldman Sachs doing the same. You know what we're at, what? How do you bring the customer to the table in a way that is that is emerging in this space and marrying those two? I think will create a lot of a lot of opportunity and then in terms of specific skill sets you know the solutions i'm seeing in carbon removal are everything from accelerated um, rock mineralization and hence being a geologist to you know advanced microbiology to whatever so um i'd say high level would be entrepreneurship of of all of these dis very disciplined scientific and engineering fields I'll just add to, in addition to all the technical skills that have been mentioned now, I mean, don't forget that there are also huge needs for business strategy, marketing, finance, you know, pitching to investors, all of those things, which are not necessarily the strengths of the technical founders sometimes. So they often need to find a good pair. And we see that all the time um, from the XPRIZE perspective. And we've also been hosting a series of matchmaking sessions where teams kind of pitch their idea and kind of call out for the other um, missing pieces and team members that they don't have. So, you know, even if you don't already know the ins and outs of carbon removal or you don't have an engineering degree, like there is still something to give here. So keep that in mind and, you know, try and, and reach out to some of these other startups that look interesting to you and see if you can help because chances are they could probably use it. So I just am gonna add on another question similar. We started talking a little bit about 
the market in this last one, but we have a specific question from Paul um, that says, regardless of the CDR approach, we will all need a market for carbon credit offsets. What activities are going on that would benefit the teams? There's been a, a little discussion so far about Microsoft, Stripe, and Shopify. Just for the benefit of everyone who's listening, the 230 people here, can someone just give the background of exactly what those three companies are doing so far? And then maybe, you know, open floor about other ideas for the market um, growth in the future that we see. I was gonna I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Microsoft, <laughs> Microsoft has the world's leading carbon commitment. They have committed to becoming entirely carbon negative uh, by 2050, cleaning up the entire footprint of their company. Uh, so that is the industry leading commitment. There are literally dozens and dozens and dozens of other companies besides the ones mentioned that have commitments. There's just very few that are buying carbon right now, like Shopify and Stripe. And they're not really buying carbon uh, in the conventional sense. They are funding long-term research and development uh, to create the, the stream of future carbon that they might be able to buy to meet their commitments because they're paying you know, prices way above the conventional market in order to seed the space. And that's what we need. And the announcement yesterday uh, where the breakthrough energy catalyst got a billion dollars uh, of philanthropic money to help develop uh, green energy. It's the exact thing we need in this space. We need de-risking capital. We're not ready for investment capital yet unless it's extremely long-term investment capital. And, and that's not true for every approach, but for many, what they need is de-risking capital, the money to build out their technologies, prove the relative safety, not absolute safety, because nothing's safe, but the relative safety to the no action alternative, which is unsafe, uh, and and to encourage people to come in. But um, you know, I think these companies like Microsoft and Shopify and Stripe are blazing the trail for that. Yeah, and I'll I'll just kind of build on that too, in the sense that so you know what a lot of these really leading edge companies like Microsoft are doing is basically they're, they're going to go create a market. Um, and it's, it's, you know, but what they're doing is really in kind of this voluntary offset world. So Microsoft goes and issues an RFP, they say they'll pay a thousand bucks a ton for somebody that can permanently remove CO2. And then an emerging technology company can go win that RFP and then access that risk capital that Brad was mentioning is in such short supply. Um, the question is, is, how do you start moving that into a compliance base? So in Canada, you've got um, you know, all these compliance protocols that you can access that tend to be slow and bureaucratic. Um, but if there was a simple, transparent, fungible market um, to unlock that, that would unlock a lot of the kind of risk capital. Because Brad's right, there is so much green infrastructure money at the infrastructure size level, and there's not enough at the kind of risk level. And how, how can we unlock that? And I think there's some really interesting solutions that are coming to the table. I'm, I'm hopeful of which some will be announced at, at COP26. Also from the supplier perspective, um, if you look at Climeworks or carbon engineering, what they're trying to do is really differentiate carbon removal product offset, whatever you want to call it, and carbon credits, because historically carbon credits, it's avoided CO2 emissions. So, I'm gonna build a solar plant and that solar plant is gonna avoid electricity from coal, just very, very simply put. That's avoided emissions. Carbon removal is completely different from climate impact perspective. You're actually taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. So you're, you're, not, you're not avoiding future rings. You're, you're like repairing, like Brad was saying, you're like repairing damage. So I think collectively, we should try to have a different market and with a different value uh, one ton of CO2 removed has a different value from a climate impact perspective than one ton of CO2 avoided. And that's, honestly, this is new. <laughs> like all the CO2 schemes in Europe, ETS, in Canada, in California, it's all about carbon emission reduction compared to a baseline. It's not about carbon removing absolute tons of CO2. So there is a lot of market education uh, to be done there and potentially trying to build a completely different uh, offset market. And, and just maybe briefly to give the European perspective on this, 
A very good point. I completely agree with with Frederick. And interestingly enough, uh, the U.S. you know very recently published or indicated that they would indeed um, differentiate between avoidance reduction credits or reductions and removals, also potentially in markets. Whether that is going to be a compliance market or will stay a, a voluntary market, that is still up for grabs. And hopefully we'll have something on that next year. But at least they have explicitly made this distinction, which I think is crucial also for the market going forward. Um, for the voluntary market, I think we're in this weird situation where typically you'd say that the supplier you know, wants to build barriers to entry for other suppliers. Right now, I think costs are prohibitive actually for buyers to come in. Right? So there might be actually buyers who would like to you know, procure permanent carbon removals, but costs are simply too high. You know, they, they might not have the luxury or the balance sheet of a Microsoft to Stripe or Shopify to be able to pay 600, 700, 800 bucks for a Climeworks uh, direct air capture credit. So I think that is one of the reasons why we're seeing sort of a, a lack of market. Uh, it, it's not necessarily only because there's a lack of supply, uh, but also because costs are unfortunately so prohibitive. Thank you guys. Those are all great points. I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, we're really entering a new phase here of what this is going to look like. And it's messy in the definition phase that we're in right now, trying to transition from an old way of thinking about carbon to actually what it would cost to price carbon removal correctly. Um, so we 100% agree with those, those points and you know hope to contribute to that conversation through the prize as well over the next few years. I got a few questions just asking for everyone's contact info again. So I know a few of you have shared it, but if everyone can just share their, um, their website and whatever email address is best to reach you and your program at in the chat, that would be great. So folks can see it all like fresh and they can get it in the last few minutes of the session in case they want to follow up with anyone directly. Uh, we have a question here from John about what modalities of CDR are not getting enough attention and need more basic research prior to implementation? I think that's interesting. We see a lot of people kind of asking about that and I think everyone maybe has a different take on it, but I'm sure there's some similarities. So I'd be curious what everybody's answer is to that one. Uh, I can jump in quickly on the ocean space. We just actually published today and sent out a, a announcement about it. Uh, three technology roadmaps um, around three big domains of ocean-based carbon dioxide removal. And you can find them at oceanvisions.org forward slash roadmaps. But they are basically uh, the culmination of a year of work with a global crowd to identify the current state of technology in those three big domains, the most critical challenges they face to move forward in R&D, and a whole suite of first order priorities, which are what are the most critical things that need to be unlocked sequentially uh, and sometimes consecutively to move the field forward. Like that issue of additionality that we talked about, right? Until we can crack monitoring and verification through ocean pathways, we're always gonna be struggling. And there's a number of other items highlighted in the maps just like that. And so that's a really a, a direct answer to that question we've tried to We've tried to specifically lay out what the state of the field is and what needs to happen next. And uh, it's very interactive and you can sign up to be a contributor and you can also uh, leave comments and, and suggest changes like a Wikipedia page. Any other takers? What are the overlooked areas of CDR? I think one that, that I always feel doesn't get the credit it, it potentially deserves, so that could be a, a lowing fruit is, is um, bioenergy carbon capture on waste, waste energy plants. Uh, it is, you know, you already have the facility on site. Uh, you just need to install the carbon capture unit. And because, you know, depending on how the fraction of organic waste is, it depends from incineration, incineration unit to incineration unit. You have up to 50, 55% um, potential negative emissions of CDR through the organic portion in that waste. And I think that is one that you know, is, isn't the most sexy, uh, but I, it should be one that we should consider because it, it also could be an entry pass uh, for CDR into more you know, public procurement processes because a lot of these incinerators are actually publicly held. 
So they they could you know dip their toes into CDR without having to spend quote unquote too much money. Obviously, there's some capex involved, but I'd love to see more recognition of that of that potential. I'll do low energy intensity CDR solutions. Um, there's some fantastic work that's being done out there, but some of them are always predicated on just like endless supplies of free renewable energy. Um, and that's not going to be realistic. And I think getting an energy efficient solution is going to be um, the winner. I can just hop in from experience working with the first batch of air miners launchpad companies. Like what are, what are they missing? Cause they're going to be ones that are, that are kind of working with other companies. Um, two things. Uh, storage is a, is a big missing area and verification. Um, yeah, a lot of teams right now are kind of doing this vertical integration of we do capture, we do storage, we do it all. It doesn't seem like it's sustainable to actually build an industry. And there is a, there's a kind of this big assumption around like, yeah, we'll just kind of bury it somewhere. And if somebody really, not somebody, but there's, there's probably an entire industry there. Um, somebody else had mentioned verification earlier. You know, at the early stages, sure, we can get by by, uh, you know, just kind of having you know, a deep understanding of the, of the science and technology, but for this to scale to, to billion dollar market, trillion dollar market and beyond, we got to know where the carbon is. We got to know that it's taken out. We got to know how long it's going to stay there. That's just, that's, that's, we, we got to figure that out. Uh, and so if, if you're interested in working on that, I uh, highly encourage you to dive into either, either that or, uh, or storage. Thanks Tito. I'll just jump on the verification point for a minute. So we have our student submission deadline coming up for the XPRIZE carbon removal on October 1st. And there is a special carve out there for MRV technologies and supportive technologies that are not actually the carbon removal solution themselves. And we're seeing like a very low volume of submissions there. So if anyone on this call is working on research in this space, we are giving awards up to $100,000 each in November. So immediately out the door. Um, to support that research. So just, you know, spreading that word. If you know of anybody else who's working on that space, um, you can contact us. We are carbon removal at xprize.org. Um, but just, I feel like it's often overlooked, but it's going to be very important as the market continues to grow and we have more solutions out there. We need to be able to do MRV, you know, at a, in a scalable way across many, many different types of pathways and solutions. So I will just um, give everyone a chance for final comments. My last prompt would be, what would be one thing if you could make happen in the next year that you think would be able to help unlock the growth of the carbon removal space? So that's, that's your prompt. You can riff with it. Any final comments for the session and we'll, we'll bring this to a close. Ratify Article 6 at COP26 in Scotland. <laughs> if I had one, that would be it. For this group, I uh, encourage you to, to look for diverse founders and co-founders to work with. Um, diverse teams are going to be the ones that, that succeed at, at building this industry. Uh, and at least from a, specifically from a gender perspective, we're looking in our first two batches of Air launch Launchpad, we saw 10 to 20% of, of teams had a, 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 a woman co-founder. Uh, and so we need to improve that and also define what success looks like as well. So I think we has thoughts on that or uh, yeah, just make that part of part of what you're what you're working on. Yeah, I, I, I build on what Tito said. So uh, we, I agree with that completely in terms of diversity. Um, one of the things because of the way CDLs function, one of the things that we think is advantageous is to bring in people, potentially from different industries that are used to um, dealing, especially in business that are used to dealing with these long-term um, technologies that need significant technical de-risking, both from a, potentially from people that have worked in space or people that have worked in healthcare. I think both of those groups have very good ideas about how to manage the de-risking that needs to happen for climate. My, my one issue would be salience. I would love to see this issue get salience. You know, we're in climate week right now. I think there are maybe a, a very small number of the events at climate week are on CDR, a very small piece of the discussion at COP will be on CDR and therefore very little discussion among the world's appropriators and policymakers and investors. And so we need to raise the salience and we need these images like the bathtub emptying, like pollution cleanup, whatever it is to crack this nut of 
uh, obliviousness around this pathway for climate action. Yeah, I couldn't agree more on the, on the things that I've already mentioned. Uh, I think one thing in terms of market development, it would help a lot if the science-based target initiative, so the organization that sort of verifies um, corporate net zero pledges and plans, uh, whether they accept or you know say or, or indicate that they accept removals as part of net zero commitment, because that I think will then uh, you know allow corporates that might not have uh, procured TR yet to decide to do so, and that that would then drive the market forward. I would just say uh, people. We need more people in that space. So if you're not working on CDR or in climate change, you should. You should think about it. Uh, it's scary. It's don't get a, you know scared by technicalities. Uh, there is a space for everyone. Whether you're doing marketing, sales, accounting, uh, we're building a we're building a new industry. So we need everyone here, and uh, it take, can take time. I've done it ten years ago, uh, but there is really a, a space for everyone uh, to uh, to contribute here. Okay, I think, I think that'll do it today. I just shared a link where we will be posting the recording of the session on our XPRIZE events page. Thank you all so much for joining us. You should have all of our contact info, so definitely feel free to follow up with us, participate in these programs, and help us spread the word about all of the topics that we were talking about today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good day. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks, guys. Thanks, David. Thanks, Great to see you all. Hi.